Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020. Enjoy the lecture. So our next lesson is on one of the most masterful political speeches of the 20th century, and that was Richard Nixon's Checkers speech given in 1952. Here we see Richard Nixon depicted with his dog, whose name is Checkers, and it's from the dog's name that the speech takes its title. So as we have done with all of our subjects, we'll talk about the speaker's biography, but it's important to note here that Nixon himself will give us a version of his autobiography in the Checkers speech. Richard Milhouse Nixon was born in 1913 on January 9th in Yorba Linda, California. His mother Hannah was a Quaker and his family was relatively poor. In 1922, the family moved to Whittier, California, and his father opened a grocery store and a gas station. As Nixon tells us in the Checker speech, he and his four brothers, along with his parents, all worked in the grocery store. In 1930, Nixon graduated from Whittier High School, third in his class. He declined a tuition scholarship to Harvard so he could continue to work in his parents' grocery store. He attended Whittier College instead and lived at home. At Whittier, he became a champion debater. In 1934, Nixon graduated summa cum laude from Whittier College. He obtained a full scholarship from Duke University Law School and in 1937, again, graduated third in his class. Following his graduation from law school, he began practicing law in Whittier, California. In 1940, Nixon married Thelma Ryan, who is known as Pat. In 1942, the Nixons moved to Washington, D.C., and Richard Nixon went to work for the Federal Office of Price Administration. This was a bureaucratic office charged with the responsibility of maintaining price controls during the period of rationing in World War II. But Nixon only worked there for a few months, and later in 1942, he joined the United States Navy. He was commissioned as a lieutenant junior grade in the U.S. Naval Reserve. In 1943, he was sent to the South Pacific and served in the South Pacific Combat Air Transport Command. After the war in 1946, he was relieved of his active military duty and he resigned his commission. That same year, 1946, Nixon ran for Congress and was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from California's 12th District. As a member of Congress, Nixon served on the House Un-American Activities Committee, charged with investigating internal communist subversion in the United States. And that is on this committee that Nixon first gains wider public attention and develops his reputation. And this came about largely as a result of his instrumental work in exposing the espionage of Alger Hiss in the State Department. In 1948, Nixon was re-elected to Congress, and in 1950, he ran for and was elected United States Senator from California. Two years later, in 1952, at the Republican National Convention in August, Nixon was selected as the vice presidential running mate for Dwight D. Eisenhower. But only a month later, his political career was put in jeopardy by what he referred to as the fund crisis. And this is the context for the famous Checker speech that we will study today, given on September 23rd, 1952, to the largest television audience in American history to that point, and also widely listened to on the American radio networks. Later that year, and largely because of the success of his Checker speech, Richard Nixon was elected Vice President of the United States under Dwight Eisenhower. 
In 1956, Eisenhower and Nixon were reelected for a second term. And during Eisenhower's second term in 1959, Nixon visited the Soviet Union, where he engaged in what is now called the famous kitchen debate with Nikita Khrushchev. Nixon was there representing the United States at the American Exposition in Moscow. And while he and the Soviet leader toured the American Exhibition, they stopped in what was a model of a typical modern American kitchen and began to debate the merits of capitalism versus communism. In 1960, at the end of Eisenhower's second term, Nixon earned the Republican nomination for president and entered the campaign against John Kennedy. During that campaign, Nixon and Kennedy engaged in a series of televised debates, the first such presidential debates in American history. But on November 8th of 1960, Nixon lost to Kennedy in a very close presidential election. Two years later, Nixon ran for California governor, but he lost to Pat Brown. It was after that election loss that Nixon told the press, you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. But in 1968, Nixon ran for president again, and this time was elected 36th president of the United States, defeating the Democratic candidate Hubert H. Humphrey. The first term of Nixon's presidential administration was dominated by the issue of the Vietnam War, and these included the very controversial bombing of Cambodia, a policy that Nixon himself called the Vietnamization of the war, that is, turning the principal responsibility for fighting the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese over to the South Vietnamese Army, and then also the release of the Pentagon Papers in both the New York Times and the Washington Post. The Pentagon Papers, which did not have much to say about the Nixon administration, nevertheless exposed a considerable number of secrets and proved that the American people had been lied to about the war by several presidential administrations. There was also a considerable period of domestic protest against the war, which had continued since the previous Johnson administration. In 1973, at the beginning of his second administration, Nixon signed the Paris Peace Accords, which ended the Vietnam War. During his presidential administration, Nixon was also noted for opening up relations with the People's Republic of China. In 1972, Nixon went to China to meet with both Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai. He also improved diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union under a policy referred to as detente. And this included a nuclear arms control treaty referred to as SALT-1. It was an acronym that stood for Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. Here we have a picture of Nixon speaking with Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev. Also during his second administration, the Middle East experienced the Yom Kippur War in which Israel was attacked by several of its Arab neighbors, but which ended in a considerable Israeli victory. Nixon was also president when the first moon landing occurred in 1969. Here's a photograph of Nixon speaking to the Apollo 11 astronauts on the USS Hornet. In part because of the Yom Kippur War, the Arab states in the Middle East imposed an oil embargo on the United States, and this led to the energy crisis of the early 1970s. During the Nixon administration, we also saw the development of the Environmental Protection Agency and in domestic policy, the establishment of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the federalization of the Medicaid program, and significant health insurance reform. Nixon was re-elected in a 1972 landslide. Only the state of Massachusetts voted for his opponent, George McGovern. But the infamous Watergate break-in occurred during the 1972 campaign. In 
Very briefly, what that involved was that the committee to reelect the president had funded a break-in of the Democratic campaign offices in the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. Those Watergate burglars were caught. There was a cover-up of the connections between those Watergate burglars and the committee to reelect the president, and that cover-up was largely managed right from the White House. There are White House tapes which implicated the president. And because of Watergate and the cover-up which followed, President Nixon was impeached by the House of Representatives. And rather than face a trial in the Senate when he might be removed from office, instead, President Nixon resigned on the 9th of August, 1974. After he left office, Nixon did not completely disappear from public life. In 1976, he visited China again, this time as a private citizen. And in 1977, he sat down with the British journalist David Frost for a series of interviews. Perhaps you saw the recent film made entitled Frost Nixon. In 1978, Nixon published his memoirs. And in 1979, he visited China once again. In 1980, he came out publicly in support of the election of Ronald Reagan and in 1993 experienced the death of his wife, Pat Nixon. And Richard Nixon himself died the following year on the 22nd of April, 1994, after suffering a stroke. He was 81 years old. So our subject for today is his famous checker speech from the campaign in 1952 when he was running as vice presidential candidate with Dwight Eisenhower on the Republican ticket. And so we could ask, what is the genre of this speech? What is the exigence, the audience, and the constraints? First, and we'll talk a little bit about this in a few moments, the genre is clearly forensic. There are charges that have been leveled against Nixon, and he's responding to those charges in a speech of self-defense, a kind of political speech that we refer to as an apologia. And then what is the exigence here? In this case, there was the discovery of what was referred to in the press as a slush fund. Cash contributions had been given to the Nixon campaign and Nixon had received some money from that cash slush fund. Some had alleged that Nixon used some of that money for personal use. There were also questions about influence peddling, that is, whether some of the contributors to the campaign were expecting political favors in return for their donations. Because of the potential scandal, Nixon faced the threat of being dumped from the Republican ticket. Some were advising Eisenhower to replace Nixon as the vice presidential candidate. And so, at the recommendation of the Republican National Committee, Nixon decides to go on national television and radio and address the charges against him to offer a speech of self-defense. This is very early in the history of television, and you can see as you watch the video of the Checker speech some of the primitive production values that were, at the time, state-of-the-art. Then, who was Nixon's audience here? Obviously, all of the American people, but in particular, and this is made clear by the text of the speech itself, Nixon is speaking to the ordinary American voter. He wants to come across as much as possible as a regular guy, as one who can identify closely with the average American voter. We see him in a variety of ways crafting these identifications at a substantive level, at a stylistic level, and at a formal level. And then what are the constraints in this circumstance? The major constraints, of course, are the specific charges against Nixon and the damage those charges have done to his credibility and his reputation. And so he must respond to those charges not only on a technical or legal level, but in a way that restores confidence in his character. So we can study the speech and look for the strategies that Nixon has chosen 
to develop those connections with ordinary voters in a way that will establish his ethos and credibility and restore his reputation. So here are some of the critical questions we can ask about Richard Nixon's Checker's speech. First of all, as we noted, this speech is an example of the genre of apologia. And as an apologia, that is a speech of self-defense, it belongs to the larger category of forensic discourse. So then we could ask, what are the key legal issues upon which Nixon's speech turns? Which of the points of forensic stasis explain best what Nixon seeks to accomplish? And we could ask as well, what is the importance of the rhetorical questions in Nixon's speech? You'll see this section where he addresses his audience by asking them and actually answering a series of questions. Where do you see those rhetorical questions employed and how do they function to advance Nixon's overall purpose in the speech? We could ask furthermore, who is the Richard Nixon we meet in this speech? That is, how does Nixon's discourse aim to construct a persona or an ethos which will be judged by his audience? What are the marks of character that Nixon exhibits and how does he put those aspects of his character on display? And then what are the characteristics of Nixon's style? That is to say his language in the speech. How does his language assist him in conveying the impression he wishes to make on his audience? And a couple of more critical questions. We note that Kenneth Burke proposed that identification was a central theoretical and critical term for understanding rhetoric. And so we could ask about the Checker speech, in what ways does Nixon's speech reveal his efforts to invite his audience to identify with him? And how does Nixon then seem familiar to the members of his audience? And finally, can you explain the insertion of the story about the dog Checkers in the speech? How does this story advance Nixon's purpose in the address? And obviously, it had some importance because it is from the reference to the pet dog checkers that the speech takes its title. Now, before we look at the speech itself, let's look at some of the key aspects of Edwin Black's essay, Richard Nixon and the Privacy of Public Discourse. And I want to start here with a passage from the end of Black's essay, where he sums up his analysis of the Checker speech. And he says, as a purely technical exercise in rhetoric, the Checker speech was a masterly achievement. It saved him from political abasement and made him a hero of his party. But the speech was more than a purely technical exercise in rhetoric. It represented one of those rare historical moments when a human being at an apogee of intensity engages a subject that is the consuming passion of that person's life, the checker speech consisted of Richard Nixon talking about himself. So let's see what Black is referring to here as we go back to the beginning of Black's essay. The essay is not focused merely on the checker speech, but he's studying the checker speech within the context of Nixon's political career. And Black notes that earlier in Nixon's career, he had made his family and the disclosure of private and personal aspects of his family life a key part in his political campaigns. It is significant and strangely unremarked by Nixon's biographers that the character of Nixon's discourse in the first campaign was more personal than Voorhees's and Black is referring to Jerry Voorhees, who was Nixon's opponent in the 1946 congressional race in California. In examining the posters, advertisements, and campaign literature that survive from 1946, one must take note of the extent to which Nixon publicized his family, his wife, daughter, and parents. By contrast, Voorhees' family was invisible, Uniformly, the representations of Voorhees 
no less by himself than by his opponent, were of a solely public man. Nowhere in the remains of that campaign is there a suggestion that Voorhees even had a private life. Instead, in a sense, he did not. And so Black is picking up on the fact that Nixon exploits this difference between public and private to his advantage in the 1946 campaign. And he does the same thing in the 1950 campaign against Helen Gahagan Douglas for the United States Senate. Black notes that a similar pattern of appropriating for himself the private domain and consigning his opponent to the public domain emerged during Nixon's 1950 campaign for the Senate against Helen Gahagan Douglas. Nixon's family portrait was prominent in posters and pamphlets. In his 1990 memoir, In the Arena, whose dedication reads, For My Family, Nixon wrote, During my 1950 campaign for the Senate, when two-thirds of the people in California did not yet own television sets, we were able for a modest sum to buy five minutes of prime time for a TV commercial. We decided to end it with what we thought would be an appealing human interest shot with Pat and me and our daughters, Tricia, who was then four, and Julie, who was two. And of course, we'll see Nixon's family play a major role in the Checker speech as well. And here's one of the images from those early campaigns of Nixon, the family man. Then Black turns to the Checker speech and he says, in the Checker speech, the theme of secrecy intersected with its related theme of privacy. The fund was alleged to have been secret. During the Hiss Chambers controversy, Nixon had been the champion of disclosure, the determined foe of secrecy. His national reputation had been made through the expose of Alger Hiss's sinister secrets. And so when he was alleged to have a secret fund, the political jeopardy to him was especially acute. He confronted not only the danger of being associated with the stigma of political concealment, a practice that he had helped to discredit in the Hiss affair, but as well he faced the prospect of appearing hypocritical. Nixon had to disassociate himself from the odium of secrecy or suffer political ruin. He did it by committing a disclosure. To the excruciating consternation of his mother and his wife, he made public a deeply private matter. He revealed his family's finances. Black goes on to say that circumstantially, the Checker speech was a political speech. It was given by a candidate in the midst of a campaign for office. But Nixon transmuted the relationship between the speech and its public by concerning himself with his private life, his personal finances, his wife and children, his relations with his parents. So the most obvious generic response to the speech that I am listening to a campaign address by a politician was obscured by Nixon and became something else, that I am listening to the self-vindication of a husband father, and son. Black goes on to comment on the ways that Nixon tried to identify with the average American voter. The sorts of revelations that Nixon made in the Checker speech worked to cement his link to those people. His revelations exhibited his fundamental allegiance to the private domain, his incurring debt for the housing of his family, his scrupulous financial arrangements with his parents, his stout defense of his wife's appearance in her modest coat, and of his daughter's affection for the family dog. For those to whom the public-private distinction was morally definitive, the Checker speech went beyond mere rebuttal and exculpation. It was also a test of courage and a display of virtue. For them, the Checker speech more than absolved Nixon, it recommended him. And indeed, it did so quite successfully. So now let's take a look at Richard Nixon's Checker speech as we listen to excerpts of the speech 
and read through portions or passages of the text. Now, you can watch the video of the full checker speech. Its link is on Canvas, but I'll have you listen to the excerpts because a good number of Americans also listen to the speech on the radio. I'm sure that you have read the charge and you've heard it that I, Senator Nixon, took $18,000 from a group of my supporters. Now, was that wrong? And let me say that it was wrong. I'm saying, incidentally, that it was wrong, not just illegal, because it isn't a question of whether it was legal or illegal. That isn't enough. The question is, was it morally wrong? I say that it was morally wrong if any of that $18,000 went to Senator Nixon for my personal use. I say that it was morally wrong if it was secretly given and secretly handled. And I say that it was morally wrong if any of the contributors got special favors for the contributions that they made. And now to answer those questions, let me say this. Not one cent of the $18,000 or any other money of that type ever went to me for my personal use. Every penny of it was used to pay for political expenses that I did not think should be charged to the taxpayers of the United States. Now in this first passage, we see the clear forensic elements of the speech. Nixon refers to the charges against him. He asks the audience, was that wrong? And he gives a direct response to the charge. He says, for instance, not a cent of the $18,000 or any other money of that type ever went to me for my personal use. We note here that right away, the people listening and watching on television are put into the position as if they're members of a jury, that they're going to issue a verdict on the guilt or innocence of Richard Nixon. And so that question, was that wrong, or was that illegal, or was that immoral, are the central questions that Nixon must address and which constrain his rhetorical situation. Do you think that when I or any other senator makes a political speech, has it printed, should charge the printing of that speech and the mailing of that speech to the taxpayers? Do you think, for example, when I or any other senator makes a trip to his home state to make a purely political speech, that the cost of that trip should be charged to the taxpayer? Do you think when a senator makes political broadcasts or political television broadcasts, radio or television, that the expense of those broadcasts should be charged to the taxpayers? Well, I know what your answer is. It's the same answer that audiences give me whenever I discuss this particular problem. The answer is no. The taxpayer shouldn't be required to finance items which are not official business, but which are primarily political business. And then we see Nixon using a combination of anaphora, that is that repetition figure of speech, but here in the form of a series of rhetorical questions. But note as well that in following this pattern, what Nixon is doing is he's identifying his way of thinking with that of his audience. Just as he asks them, do you think that when I or another senator makes a political speech, has it printed, should charge the printing of the speech and the mailing of the speech to the taxpayers, he's forming a question that perhaps the members of the audience would themselves ask. And he says also and articulates explicitly what the answer to those questions should be. He says, I know what your answer is. It's the same answer that audiences give me whenever I discuss this particular problem. The answer is no. So Nixon not only has asked the question, but he's given the answer, and he's now thinking in a pattern that's similar to the thinking of the people in his audience. Let me say, incidentally, that some of you may say, well, that's all right, Senator. That's your explanation. But have you got any proof? And I'd like to tell you this evening that just an hour ago, we received an independent audit of this entire fund. I suggested to Governor Sherman Adams, who was the chief of staff of the Dwight Eisenhower campaign, that an independent audit 
and legal report be obtained. And I have that audit here in my hand. It's an audit made by the Price Waterhouse and Company firm and the legal opinion by Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, lawyers in Los Angeles, the biggest law firm and incidentally, one of the best ones in Los Angeles. I am proud to be able to report to you tonight that this audit and this legal opinion is being forwarded to General Eisenhower. And I'd like to read to you the opinion that was prepared by Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher and based on all the pertinent laws and statutes, together with the audit report prepared by the certified public accountants. Quote, it is our conclusion that Senator Nixon did not obtain any financial gain from the collection and disbursement of the fund by Dana Smith that Senator Nixon did not violate any federal or state law by reason of the operation of the fund, and that neither the portion of the fund paid by Dana Smith directly to third persons, nor the portion paid to Senator Nixon to reimburse him for designated office expenses constituted income to the Senator, which was either reportable or taxable as income under applicable tax laws. Signed, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher by Elmo H. Conlon. Now that, my friends, is not Nixon speaking, but that's an independent audit which was requested because I want the American people to know all the facts and I'm not afraid of having independent people go in and check the facts. And now again, because we think of this as a forensic speech, it's important to note that place in the address where Nixon introduces his inartistic proof in this case, it's that report from the accountant and the legal opinion given by the law firm. As Nixon says right after this passage, this is not Nixon speaking. And so he's emphasizing that it's the law firm and the accounting firm which are testifying to the truth of Nixon's claims and offering documentary evidence on Nixon's behalf. And there's some that will say, well, maybe you were able, Senator, to fake this thing. How can we believe what you say? After all, is there a possibility that maybe you got some sums in cash? Is there a possibility that you may have feathered your own nest? And so now what I am going to do, and incidentally, this is unprecedented in the history of American politics. I am going at this time give to this television and radio audience a complete financial history. Everything I've earned, everything I've spent, everything I owe. And I want you to know the facts. I'll have to start early. I was born in 1913. Our family was one of modest circumstances and most of my early life was spent in a store out in East Whittier. It was a grocery store, one of those family enterprises. The only reason we were able to make it go was because my mother and dad had five boys and we all worked in the store. And then we get the introduction of Nixon's self-disclosure. Now in this passage, we hear Nixon set up that disclosure by announcing that it is unprecedented in the history of American politics. And so he previews what that disclosure will include. It will be his full financial history. But he does it then, notice, in a narrative form. And he begins the narrative as an autobiography. I was born in 1913. Our family was one of modest circumstances. And most of my early life was spent in a store out in East Whittier. This prepares the audience now to hear the life story of Richard Nixon. It will be abbreviated, but the important thing is Nixon is invoking the narrative form here, and each component of his narrative contains another element with which the members of his audience can then identify. And we'll see those identifications in this next passage. I worked my way through college and to a great extent through law school. And then in 1940, probably the best thing that ever happened to me happened. I married Pat, who's sitting over here. We had a rather difficult time after we were married, like 
so many of the young couples who may be listening to us. I practiced law. She continued to teach school. Then in 1942, I went into the service. Let me say that my service record was not a particularly unusual one. I went to the South Pacific. I guess I'm entitled to a couple of battle stars. I got a couple of letters of commendation, but I was just there when the bombs were falling. And then I returned. Returned to the United States, and in 1946, I ran for the Congress. When we came out of the war, Pat and I, Pat, during the war, had worked as a stenographer and in a bank, and as an economist for a government agency. And when we came out, the total of our savings from both my law practice, her teaching, and all the time that I was in the war, the total for that entire period was just a little less than $10,000. Everything of that, incidentally, was in government bonds. Well, that's where we start when I go into politics. So in this passage and in several others that follow, we see all of the different particular aspects by which Nixon shows that his life is the ordinary life. That is, he's just like most members of his audience. For instance, in 1952, virtually every able-bodied American man of the right age group had done something during World War II to serve his country. And Nixon, in that sense, is just explaining, I did my part as well. I'm just like you. He talks about other things, like owning a 1952 Oldsmobile car. He talks about paying $80 a month for rent. Each one of these elements of his life story becomes a point of identification with the members of his audience. I should say this, that Pat doesn't have a mink coat. But she does have a respectable Republican cloth coat. And I always tell her that she'd look good in anything. One other thing I probably should tell you, because if I don't, they'll probably be saying this about me too. We did get something, a gift, after the election. A man down in Texas heard Pat in the radio mention the fact that our two youngsters would like to have a dog. And believe it or not, the day before we left on this campaign trip, we got a message from the Union Station in Baltimore saying they had a package for us. We went down to get it. You know what it was? It was a little cocker spaniel dog in a crate that he'd sent all the way from Texas. Black and white, spotted. And our little girl, Tricia, the six-year-old, named it Check. And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. And there you have it, the famous passage which makes reference to the family dog, Checkers. But notice again, all of this is done in the narrative style, and it's developing a sense of pathos, a sense of personal connection, emotional connection with Richard Nixon and his family we see, as Black observed, a man vindicating himself as a father, a son, and a husband. And notice, too, in this passage, in the narrative of the passage, how Nixon invites the members of the audience to participate in the story. He begins the story by talking about the message they received from Union Station in Baltimore. And we went down to get it, he says, but then he asks, do you know what it was? And you can imagine people all over the country watching on television, listening on the radio, saying, it was a dog, it was a dog. And Nixon, of course, confirms that. It was a little cocker spaniel dog in a crate that he had sent all the way from Texas. And you can imagine now the people emotionally connected to the story, sympathizing with Nixon and his family, identifying with him and his wife and his children, and so Nixon has accomplished that important part of identification with the voters he has to persuade. Well, the response to the Checker speech was overwhelmingly favorable for Nixon. People wrote and sent telegrams to the Republican National Committee, and Eisenhower decided to keep Nixon on the ticket. As the headline in the New York Times said, 
Nixon left it up to the voters to signal to the Republican National Committee whether they thought he should stay on the ticket or not. And the vast majority who responded gave Nixon their support and Eisenhower decided to keep him on the ticket. And the fund crisis or the fund scandal was never an issue again. And of course, then Nixon went on to be elected vice president under Dwight Eisenhower. Here he appears on the cover of Life magazine from 1953. So there's our discussion of Richard Nixon and his famous checker speech from 1952. If you have any questions or comments about Nixon or the checker's address, please post them to the discussion board.